This morning we're going to deal with a subject I think a lot of us sometimes have questions about, and that is the subject of prayer. And I don't know about you, but for me personally, if I'm going to do something, I want to get a good result. How many of you would say that's a good thing? If you're going to do something, you want to get a good result. And, you know, when it comes to many topics, but particularly the topic of prayer, there's a lot of ideas we sometimes have that are religious ideas, but they aren't necessarily grounded in the Bible. And I think sometimes social media amplifies all this. You know, now with Facebook and Twitter, sometimes it's almost a daily contest to see who can come up with the, the cutest saying of the day for Twitter. And the problem with that in terms of faith or theology is sometimes things get said on social media that they're nice sounding, but they're not necessarily true when it comes to the Bible. And there are sometimes these sayings about prayer. And you've probably heard some of these occasionally. You know, maybe you've prayed and, you know, somebody might post as a status update, well, you know, God responds to prayer in three different ways. Yes, no, no. Or maybe. Or the alternative I've seen of that is God responds to prayer three ways. Yes, no, or not now. And we see those things, but then when we actually come to the Bible, we have a problem. For instance, in Mark chapter 11, Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Wait a second. That's what the Bible says, but I just saw on Twitter that if I prayed... I'm going to get a yes, no, or maybe response. Or I'm going to get a yes, no, or not now response. And so we, as we are Christians and we read the Bible, we're studying the Bible and we're learning, but then we, we see things on Christian TV, we read social media, Facebook and Twitter, and we have all these ideas, and some, some good, some bad, but religious ideas. We try and fit all this together in our lives, but then when we're unsuccessful in our prayer life or we pray and we don't get an answer or things don't come through we're left confused and that's the whole reason why there are these cop-out sayings you know preachers oftentimes have trite sayings like oh God didn't answer your prayer but well maybe the reason was because God's not sure or maybe the reason God didn't answer the prayer is because the answer is not now however God feels today but see if we're going to have truth in our lives we have to go by what God's word says, not by what are just convenient answers. Or how about this? Well, maybe it wasn't God's will. And that is the ultimate preacher cop-out. Well, maybe it wasn't the will of God. And that works in all situations. Somebody comes up to you and they're disappointed about something that happened at work. Well, brother, must have been the will of God. Somebody doesn't get an answer to prayer sister, must have been the will of God. Something doesn't quite go, so must. and so God gets all the blame, and in the process, we're not evaluating what it is that we're doing. And so in 1 John, John is dealing with us. Dear children, brothers and sisters, he's talking to us. Now before we get to verse 21 here in chapter 3, let's reread verses 18 through 20. We covered that last week, because this flows into where we'll be at today. Dear children, verse 18, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. Action. So John, very much like James, communicates that faith without action is dead, that if we're going to do this thing, we've got to really live the life with actions and in truth. And what's funny is that James and John, they both use similar illustrations. And we dealt with this, Pastor dealt with this on walking in love. If you, if you see a neighbor in need, if you see a neighbor or a brother and sister in Christ and they, they can't put food on the table or they're going through hard times, if, if your response as a Christian is just like, well, I hope it works out for them, James and John are both like, well, what good is your faith? And so they say that there has to be action, but with actions and in truth. Verse 19, this then is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. See, when we 
are Christians and we call ourselves by Christ and we go to church and we get all dressed up and our Facebook info about page says Christian or you know Bible believing Christian or super duper Bible believing Christian or whatever it says the problem we run into is when we don't genuinely live the Christian life well, I'm a I'm a follower of Jesus but I'm a total a-hole I'm going to do my best to make it as plain as possible this morning I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm a jerk. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm a liar. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I'm mean. I'm mean to my wife. I'm mean to my coworkers. I'm mean to everyone. I'm a follower of Jesus, but when was the last time I read the Bible? I'm a follower of Jesus, but when was the last time I prayed? And all of that. So you, you get into a situation where you're claiming Jesus, 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 Jesus. You're not really living the Christian life. And what happens is your heart condemns you. Then you go to, you, you're, you're living that way, which we go back to 1 John chapter 1. See, what is that? That's a Christian who claims to be in the light, yet walking in darkness. So you're, you're living that way, you're in darkness, you're in darkness, but then you come up to a challenge in life. Maybe a challenge in your marriage, or a challenge with a child, or a challenge at work, or whatever it is. Well, oops. Suddenly, you need to rejigger things and get right with God. Why? Well, you need something from God. You want God to move on your behalf. We get into these situations where our hearts condemn us. So what we're going to discover this morning is that the secret to answered prayer is genuinely living the Christian life. Genuinely living the Christian life. When you claim Christ and you come to church, but you aren't really living the Christian life, you aren't as we saw in verse 18, living the Christian life with action and in truth, when you live that way, when you are a lukewarm believer, not really on fire for God, not really faithful to God, when you live that way, you live in such a way where your heart condemns you because you know down inside you're not living the way Christ has called you to live. And here's where that becomes a problem in prayer. When your heart condemns you, you don't have confidence before God. You then go into the presence of God to ask God something, to ask God something on your behalf, but your heart condemns you. You don't have confidence. So instead of stepping into the throne room of God with confidence, as the book of Hebrews tells us to do, you step into the throne room of God in fear, in doubt, maybe afraid, maybe scared. Why? Because you lack confidence. Your heart condemns you. And we see all throughout the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, the ministry of Jesus, God responds to faith. Pastor Wednesday night used the example of the centurion. And Jesus said of the Roman centurion that he had not seen such great faith in Israel. And all the centurion said was, Lord, just say it. You don't even need to come into my house. Just say it. And I know my sermon will be healed because I'm a man of authority and under authority. And I know what that means, what that is. He was Fully and completely confident. What is that? F-A-I-T-H. But what we sometimes do is we're not living, really living the Christian life. Our hearts then condemn us because we, we know what we should be doing. We know how we should be living, but we're not. Our hearts condemn us. And so whenever then we need to go to God, we don't go to God in confidence. We don't go to God fully persuaded. We don't go to God in a position of faith. And that's why a lot of times those prayers simply do not work. Let's look at verse 21, 1 John 3 and verse 21. Dear friends, if, anytime you see that in the Bible, you got to stop and pay attention. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God. So is it possible to, as Hebrew says, to enter the throne room of God with confidence to present our prayers and requests. Absolutely. But the way we get there is by genuinely living the Christian life, living in such a way so that our hearts do not condemn us. We go back to verses 18 through 20. What do we do when our hearts condemn us? How do we set our hearts at rest in His presence, as verse 19 says? Well, it gives us the answer in verse 18. Let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth being the real deal, living with sincerity, genuinely living the Christian life. If our hearts do not 
condemn us. We have confidence. And look at how it continues in verse 22. And receive from him, from God, anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. And there's, there's a lot to unpack here. He says, and receive from him anything we ask. So is that limited? Is anything limited? Yeah. Come on, it's all right. Wake up this morning. Is, an, is anything limited? So how do we square that with all the cute Twitter sayings that are out there? See, is the problem God? Is the problem with what God is doing? Or is the problem with what we're doing? See, when we have those cute sayings, well, maybe your answer is a maybe. Or maybe it's not in the Lord's timing. Or, or, or maybe, maybe it's not God's will. See, we're shifting all the blame to God. God gets blamed for a lot of stuff he's not responsible for. So does the devil. Anything. That is open-ended. We receive from him anything we ask. Why? Look at what he says. Look at the language. Why? He uses because. Why do we receive anything we ask? Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. So see, right off the bat, we see that not every person who claims Christ is going to experience or enjoy this kind of relationship with Father God. Why? Well, because at the end of the day, not everybody's really living that way. They're not really obeying His commands and doing what pleases God. And what pleases God? What pleases God is living by faith. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it is impossible to please Him because anyone that comes in must believe that He exists and that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. See, if I believe God exists, that changes everything. That changes the way I live. That changes the way I treat people. That changes the way I'm a husband, the way I'm a father. It changes the way I'm a a son. It changes the way I'm an employee. It changes everything in my life. If I truly believe that God exists, and if I truly believe that the God who exists gave us his Bible, which is his word, which says that if you live this way, you'll get one result, and you live this other way, you'll get another result. If I believe all that, I'm going to really live it out. And then on top of that, Hebrews says, and believe that he is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. Oh, so I believe he exists, therefore I really live the life. And in doing that, he rewards me. Why? Because I earnestly seek him. Well, we go back to 1 John. If I live that way, if you live that way, then you're the man or woman who does what? who obeys his commands and do, who does what pleases God. And see, when you live that way, the relationship is totally different. Think about in a family. Maybe you're in a family like this where, you know, there are some children that are, that are grown and they're good children. When holidays roll around, you want to see them show up or your parents want to see your brothers or sisters show up. But some families have what are called the black sheep of the family, right? And it's the person that nobody wants coming around. Why? There, there's always a problem. There's always a situation. There's always strife or drama. That person is an embarrassment to the family. Well, see, the reality is, and if we, we see this, we know this, when we're good children and we come home to see our parents, it's a totally different interaction or situation Then if we're that black sheep who's been doing his own thing, her own thing, bringing shame to the family, and then shows up and says, I would like something. It's different. And you might say, well, Austin, you know, God's no respecter of persons, and God doesn't show favoritism, and God rewards those who earnestly seek him. We all have equal opportunity before God, but if we just use our common sense, it's obvious, it's obvious in the Bible, not everybody gets the same result with God. Consider Saul and David. Saul had everything before him, every opportunity, and he threw it away. He eventually consulted with the witch, the witch of Endor. He went out in a bad way. 
Consider, we last few weeks ago, we talked about Cain and Abel. They didn't have the same result before God. And so that's what we face in our lives. What kind of believer am I going to be? Am I going to be somebody who's faithful or faithless? Am I going to be somebody who's on fire for God or lukewarm? Am I going to be someone who strives to earnestly please God and to obey Him and His Word? Or am I just going to do my own thing and then whenever I have a, a problem, a challenge, a situation, run into the throne room and hope I have enough faith to get the answer I'm seeking? I would submit to you, I'd rather live a genuine Christian life and have confidence before Him. Knowing I have done everything I know to do so that when there's a challenge, there's a problem, there's a situation, I can stand in His presence with confidence. Now there's, there's a subtle thing here. And pastor will sometimes refer to this. See, if you live your life this way where you're living the life you're walking in obedience, you're being faithful, you're going to have a lot fewer problems, challenges, and situations. Now, that doesn't mean they won't ever come, but they will be fewer and far between. The person who always has fires that need to be put out is the believer that instead of living like a sheep, they're living like a goat, they're living like a wolf, and they're doing their own thing all the time. That's the sheep, the animal, the livestock, that instead of getting a blessing from the shepherd, they need the rod of correction. See, it's a totally different relationship, different result. If our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence and receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. See, so I'm in a problem, I'm in a situation, I'm in a challenge. God. God, I need you to do this on my behalf. And I don't get the answer I'm looking for. What we have the tendency to do is to blame him. It's not his will. It's not his time. Not his purpose. Instead of yes, he said no. The last thing we want to do is look at ourselves and say, hmm, have I been obeying his commands? Hmm, have I been living in a way that is pleasing to God? See, this makes us responsible. Cain was responsible for the result he got. Abel was responsible for the result he got. Saul was responsible for the result he got. David was responsible for the result he got. We are responsible before God. If our hearts do not condemn us. So when we're not living the Christian life genuinely, our hearts condemn us. And when your heart condemns you, you don't have confidence before God. The result is a Christian life that lacks the power of God and a Christian life that lacks power in prayer. See, we, this is, none of this is coincidence. Why do some people seem to just have God's hand upon them? They're doing something different. Why do some people just seem that that, that they have the power of God on their life. Well, maybe they're spending more time consecrating themselves to God, spending time in prayer in the Word. Remember the occasion where the disciples were trying to cast a demon out, and they were unable to do it. So they brought the person to Jesus. Jesus successfully cast, it, cast the demon out, and they were like, well, Jesus, why didn't this work for us? And Jesus said, this kind comes only out by prayer and by fasting. So what is the implication there? Who had not been doing enough prayer and fasting? Was it Jesus? Was it the Father? Was it the Spirit? No, it was the disciples. Who needed to pray more? The disciples. Who needed to fast more? See, if we're looking at our lives, is it God that needs to do more? See, a lot of times we act like that. God, you need to do more. You need to do more. You need to do more. You're not doing enough. But is that the issue or is it more? Who needs to pray more? Who needs to read the Bible more? Who needs to take separation and consecration more seriously? Who needs to take personal holiness more seriously? 
You look through the Bible, great men and women of God, they spent time alone with God in prayer. When Moses came down from the mountain and his face shone, why? Was it because that he had been down in the camp partying with the people? Had he been at the honky-tonk? No, he had been where? On the mountain with God. See, so when you as a believer are reading the Bible and praying and developing your relationship with God, it shows in your life. But see, when you're doing the opposite, that shows as well. So how do we gain confidence? How do we gain confidence? The answer is obedience. Because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Verse 23, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. Action. Genuine Christianity. Really living the life. To believe in him. If we believe in him, truly it changes everything. The way we live, the way we conduct ourselves. And then John makes it plain so we can't mess it up. Love one another. And as we've said previously in this series, loving one another sums up anything that we are supposed to do as Christians. It sums it all up. I can't mistreat someone if I'm walking in love. If I'm walking in love, then I'll be the husband or father or son or employee I'm supposed to be. I'll, I'll be that person. Why? It's the love walk. So this morning, what I want you to walk away with is this, that in order to see God's power in your life, to see God's answers in your life, if you want to live a life where when you pray, there is a response You've got to determine to be the real deal. To be the bona fide, genuine believer in Christ. Not just here at church when we all blow dry our hairs or gel our hair and get all pretty. But Monday when you don't feel like it. And Tuesday when you don't feel like it. And Wednesday. All throughout the week. See, Christianity is not just more, not just a band-aid. And a lot of times we treat God and our faith like a band-aid. I'll just do my own thing, but when I get in a challenge, oh, I'm going to pull God right out of the box and stick him on. And why would we be surprised that when we do it, we get a poor result? Doesn't work. We've got to live the life. We've got to obey. Then look at verse 24, and this is powerful, and it connects right in with another famous passage on prayer, and that's John 15. Verse 24, those who obey his commands live in him and he in them. Those who obey. So is it those who talk about obeying? Is it those who have, they would like to obey? Who lives in him? Those who obey. Now why is this important? Another famous verse on prayer from John, the same author, John 15, 7. He said, this is Jesus speaking to the disciples. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. See, as I said, man, you come to some of these verses on prayer and they just fly in the face of all of our religious lingo and talk. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. So then the question is, how do we remain? We have the answer here in 1 John 3 and verse 24. How do we remain? How do we abide? How do we live in him? How do we make sure? How do we know? See, we go back to verses 18 through 21. How do I get to a place in my life where I have confidence that I am remaining in him and he in me? How do I get into a place in my life where in my heart, deep down inside, I know I am in him and he is in me? That way, when I go into the throne room of God, I'm not recommitting my life every time. You know, I, I'm in a challenge. I got to run into the throne room. Wait, wait, before I pray, I got 1 John 1, 9. And I need to confess this, 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 and this, this. Okay, confidence, confidence, confidence. How do I get to a place where there's confidence? How do I get to a place where I can pray and know he hears and answers 
whether I'm at home, whether I'm in the car, whether I'm at work, whether I'm at Taco Bell or at the drive through at McDonald's or outside the gas station or in the grocery store, how do I get to that place where I have confidence? He gives the answer, verse 24, those who obey his commands. And see, this is something that we see you know, I've been in church, grown up in church my entire life. This is something I would say I see behind the scenes all the time. It's something you see in life and death situations. When somebody, as who is a believer, is facing a serious, serious challenge. There are times when you're in those challenges, you're in those moments. There are times when I would say I've seen confidence. They've got confidence. They've got confidence in God. They've got confidence in their pastor. They've got confidence in the Word of God, they've got confidence in who they are in Christ. And I've seen situations where it's the complete and total opposite. It is fear, 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 just hopeful for something good. And that is why there is a disparity of results. Now, God is gracious. God is merciful. Are there times when somebody has not lived faithfully to God and they have not lived obediently and they're in a real pickle that God comes through on their behalf? Well, sure. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's kind. But can we say with 100% certainty that God does that all the time? No. No. And if we would be honest about what we see and what we see that goes on around us, we would say it's obvious. I would rather go into his presence with confidence than just hope. He gives me one more chance to become a genuine believer, the genuine real deal follower. Now, we don't have too much time to get into this, but this is why it's, we, have, we put the daily Bible reading on the website. You will mature in your walk with God so much if you would just read your Bible. And not just your favorite parts, but read big sections of it. Read, if you'll do the daily Bible reading in the course of a year, you'll read the entire Bible. Lukewarm doesn't work with God backsliddenness, it's not even a word, doesn't work with God. And if you'll read your Bible, you'll see that there are examples where people get off the right road with God. And he's merciful, he's kind, he does things on their behalf. But there comes a point where it stops. We're there, we're on prayer, I guess I might as well deal with it. There are actually places where God tells the people in the Old Testament that he has had enough that he will no longer hear them. That is sobering. Why? Is it because God's, maybe, maybe that was a no? It was a no Tuesday? Is that why God told them that? It was a no Tuesday? No. They were continually doing their own thing. And unfortunately, this message is out there in popular Christianity today. You see it on Twitter. You see it on Facebook. It doesn't matter how you live. You're good with God no matter what. And that may be popular. A, a, a post like that may generate more likes than a post that says repent. <laughs> but it's dishonest. People who walk with God and people who have a genuine relationship with God and people who have a genuine prayer life and when they pray, God hears and answers. Beneath the surface, you have a real deal Christian. And so that is what we have got to determine to be in our lives. That we're going to obey. That we're going to be faithful. That we're going to genuinely live the life. 
then we can have confidence and then we can say, and we receive from our wonderful, kind, good Father anything we ask. Why? Because we obey His commands and we love one another. But we've all got work to do. I don't think any of us this morning could say, man, I am, have reached the place where I perfectly obey God. If you think you can, just you know, let everybody around you know they can move further away from you, amen, before judgment comes. I don't think any of us this morning could say, you know, I have mastered walking in love. None of us can. We've got to work on it. We've got to grow in that. We've got to strive. But it's the striving, it's the doing that gives us confidence before God. So what is the secret? As we conclude this morning, what is the secret of answered prayer? <laughs> it's being a real deal Christian. It's genuinely living the Christian life. So you have confidence. And so when you pray and ask God for something, you're asking in faith and not in doubt, not in fear, not in worry, but in faith. And that makes all the difference. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope the message this morning has been a blessing to you.